Good morning, my friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. I'm so glad that you're here today. Why don't you take your Bibles, meet me in the book of Romans chapter 8, and today let's talk about remote control from the unseen realm. This message will be a blessing to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we jump into your word, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask that right now he would illuminate the scriptures, let them come alive to our understanding. I thank you, Father, if there's anyone trapped today by the strategies of the devil, I thank you that your word always reveals a way out. We thank you, Father, for the unveiling today, and we give you all of the praise. In Jesus' name, let's all say amen. Praise God. Romans chapter 8, we're talking about today remote control. Okay, I'm sure that anybody watching me, you know how to operate one of these. Here's a remote control, okay? And uh, we know what it does. But I want us to understand how the enemy can, re can work by remote control power and how we can stop it and shut it down. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, here we see variable laws that are, that are mentioned. First, we have the law of the Spirit of life, and that is the law that's in Christ Jesus. Next, we have the law of sin and death. So, my friends, a law is a force, and it's what's in control. So for some, the law of sin and death still is having effect upon their lives, even as Christians, we want to get to the root of that problem today. Praise God. There are many believers who are held in sin because there are controlling powers that they can't see. They're invisible because they're coming from the spirit realm, and these powers do not want to let go. But the good news is, is that there is a way out. Praise God. Let's go over to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. A well-known scripture, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, the heavenly realms. My friends, our battles, according to this verse, our battles are essentially spiritual so, since that's the case, it's going to take a spiritual approach in order to produce the victory that we all desire. So, it's a spiritual problem, therefore it requires a spiritual solution. These invisible powers act as a remote control. They work through the air in a way just like a remote control does. It's wireless. I can take this, I could control a television, and I could have it turn channels. I could sit back uh, quite a distance off, and by remote control, I can do that. The signal is going through the air. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So the prince of the power of the air, anywhere there is air, he has an ability to work. Praise God. So we want to be aware of this and we want to know that how he can work even through what it's almost like pushing a remote control and he can cause certain circumstances or events to take place and they directly can have an influence upon those who are programmed to that remote. Praise God. But we thank God for freedom in Jesus. So there's a, there is a spiritual dimension to bad habits. There is a spiritual dimension to why a believer is, is not able to just stop, although they want to stop doing something that would be displeasing to the Lord. There's a spiritual dimension to ongoing depression. Mm -mm. 
And so God has a cure for all of these. Let's go over to Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, and get a little bit of an understanding of this invisible realm. Praise God. Verse 23, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now, when I was raised in church, we were taught that there were no more modern-day miracles. We were taught that God doesn't heal today. We did, we did away completely, uh, completely with the miraculous. And I actually never heard my pastor growing up ever teach one message on demons or on angels or on the invisible realm. Now, he did talk a lot about heaven. He talked a lot about hell because he wanted to uh, steer us away from hell. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the dy dynamics that are working behind the scenes that influence, uh, you know, these two destinations uh, of which people are headed, either one or the other, he never really talked about these controlling powers because he didn't know about them. And looking back, I could see that there were many in the church that I sat in growing up that they were in bondage. And if there would have been a manifestation of the anointing or of the power of the Holy Spirit, I would have no doubt that immediately in that little church that I grew up in, we would have had a very similar experience with verse 23. But you only have verse 23 when you have Christ or the anointed one or an anointing that's present that causes a reactionary element to break forth, revealing these invisible powers. Look at, look at verse 23. Now there was a man in their synagogue, or as we say, uh, you know, maybe modern day a little bit, uh, in our church service. There was somebody in our church service with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. Now, how many services had he sat there in the synagogue and there's no manifestation? Yet, the unclean spirit still has him bound in these certain areas, but there's no public manifestation. Why is it that when Jesus stands up in the synagogue as the Messiah, as the anointed one, that suddenly this unclean spirit is now speaking through him? That's because there's a clash. That's also why you can sit in a dead church all of your life and never see the Holy Spirit move once. You can even sit in a nice, clean, sanitized church, but the Holy Spirit is suppressed, and people can sit there in bondage and not experience freedom. You know, there was a lady in our church that just sitting there in the service, her nose would run so much that she would go through multiple uh, handkerchiefs in each service because her nose would never stop running. I told about this story before. One time, my mom took me and my brothers over to this lady's house. We were going to go visit her, and it was like, it was like going into a haunted house. Well, knowing what I know now and looking back, I realized, yeah, the house probably was haunted. There were spirits there, and there was a spirit on her life. I'm not saying she's demon possessed because she was a believer, but she was heavily oppressed and she was afflicted. And there are many uh, forms of uncleanness that these spirits bring. And when you're not aware of how they work, uh, oftentimes, just like a remote control does, you could sit there with the most bizarre manifestations physically, and you could think, well, I, I, I don't know how to stop it. But we know how to deal with these things. Praise God. Verse 25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Thank you, Jesus. Unclean. Unclean. What is the mission of an unclean spirit? To make you dirty. To get into your life and have access into your life where you do things usually behind the scenes, that are unclean. Mm -mm. Sometimes some Christians can't hide it. I'm talking about Christians for a moment that have allowed the door of an unclean spirit to come in. And I do know some Christians that for whatever reason, uh, they don't want to take a bath. They don't want to take a shower. 
Now they give their variable reasons. Maybe they're trying to save energy. Maybe they're trying to save water or whatever the case might be. But the problem is they stink and it's not because they're not educated towards what deodorant is. It's because they have an unclean spirit. And this can manifest in a believer even to the point where they don't comb their hair, they, uh, they stink, or they don't brush their teeth, and there's some kind of a... Uh, oftentimes, the manifestations can be real strong. I've had people ask me to pray for them to be delivered. Uh, and I would, you know, I'd say, well, what's your, what's going on? Well, Pastor Stephen, my breath smells like sulfur, smells like sulfur and rotten eggs. Oh, okay. Well, you have a demon problem. Oh, is that what that is? Pastor Stephen? Yes, that's what that is. And, uh, anytime you get into these types of areas of uncleanness, of filth, remember, remember he's a dirty devil then you're looking at the underworking of unclean spirits. And sometimes while some Christians are able to hide it and they, they, they just practice these things or yield to these things, maybe that's a better word, they yield to these things in private. For some people, the spirit is so strong that they carry that uncleanness even publicly and they don't realize how offensive it is. That's how strong a grip on the minds of the uh, of these Christians that sometimes these unclean spirits can get and they will they will end up making you walk in uncleanness just like they do let's go over to 1 John chapter 2 mm-hmm. 1 John chapter 2 let's talk about one of the big ones one of the uh, uh the big controlling powers that holds a really big remote control and is able to push buttons and cause uh, various reactions. First John chapter two, verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world. Now, verse 17 is something that we really need to be aware of. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides, remains forever. There is, of course, the spirit of the world. This is what is being referred to here. And you have to remember that in verse 18, John, the writer of this epistle, begins now to talk about the Antichrist. So the spirit of the world is an antichrist or against the anointed one type anointing. The spirit of the world directs the activities of the flesh nature. There is the lust of the flesh and the spirit of the world is aimed towards stirring up those base, carnal, crude reactions in your flesh nature. The spirit of the world actually organizes, coordinates, and monitors closely, and even supervises the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the arrogant pride of life. It does all of this for those that are in the world system, those that are under its remote control power. These wicked spirits that are in these high up realms. They sit up there, strategize, formulate plans, and then they begin to send out their minions, their demons all over the world. And the remote controls are pushed from up high and humanity that is not aware of what is going on suffers from these consequences. The spirit of the world has destroyed many families, causing even Christians to overreach and to be influenced by television commercials, newspaper ads, or mail and literature sent to their house. And thus they, they overextend on credit and the credit card companies just keep mailing out the, uh, you know, you've been pre-approved applications to your home and uh, many Christians just succumb to that. And the next thing you know, they are captured by the spirit of the world and they're up to their eyeballs 
or actually maybe their eyeballs are even beneath the waterline in debt. My friends, we have to be aware of these types of things. You know, you get around Christmas season and the spirit of the world is working very, very strong to get people to get engulfed in shopping and completely be unaware of the virgin birth that took place in Bethlehem. And it's all shopping. Uh, it's all uh, Madison Avenue uh, techniques and all of these things that would try to capture your attention, you know, and there are the nice blessings of the Lord, but with the world system, it's a system designed to keep you perpetually trapped where you're never, ever satisfied and you never have contentment. It always wants you to keep grasping and grabbing for more. And it is very, very dangerous because its whole purpose is to get your mind and your thought life off of God and to get caught up and consumed in this world's activities. Wow. These things are, are, are working from demonic remote control. Matthew chapter 16, we need to be on our toes. We need to be on our toes because the enemy, he uh, tries to break in to all areas to influence and to drop suggestions. Sometimes he can do it through other people. They could be sincere, and at the same time, they are sincerely wrong. Why? They're under the wrong spirit. Matthew chapter 16 Verse 22, then Peter took him aside. He took Jesus off to a little private area where he could straighten Jesus out. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you believe it? He's trying to rebuke God in the flesh, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. For Jesus had just told the disciples that he's going to be uh, he's going to be killed, and he's going to be raised from the dead, and he's explaining to them God's agenda, and Peter's got his own agenda. And honestly, he's not the only one that's thinking along this line. The other 11 are also thinking this man is going to be the king of kings, and we're going to be able to rule next to him. And I mean, Jesus is doing miracles, and they're just like, wow, this, this is it. So they didn't understand God's agenda and Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And that spirit of the world, uh, it will try to capture men with that arrogant pride of life, uh, your position, your place. Uh, it'll keep you in a rat race where you could have a nice home, but you think, okay, now I need a bigger home and on and on it goes and the gathering of possessions, and it's just, you know, activities and events, getting caught up in things, and just completely losing the closeness with the Lord. It is a spirit. It's a spirit. It's not just busyness. It is a spirit that works to get people into that busyness and to have their own agenda and to even compromise God's agenda. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. But my friends, that remote control is not going to work against you. Woo! Praise God. Mm -mm. I want to talk today and in some of the upcoming messages that I'm going to be sharing about how to disarm sin in your life, how to be aware that there is the evil forces with their remote control ability, but how you can walk free from it and it doesn't affect you. And they could take that remote control and, and, and uh, push the buttons over and over and it works with others, but it doesn't work on you anymore. Why? It's very simple. You're on a different frequency. Mm -mm. You are on a completely different frequency. Now at the root of every human problem, or calamity, or mess, lies the root, which is sin. And until the root is destroyed, the tree, which is producing what we don't want, bad fruit, it's going to keep on producing it. 
So what we have to do is we have to get down to the root. And when you destroy the root, the tree absolutely will die. And that's the way that we have to deal with sin. We have to disarm it in a way that we go after the root. And so you might be thinking, well, Pastor Stephen, how do I disarm it so that the remote control doesn't work on me? Well, the first thing that we have to do is that in order to have victory over sin, number one, it's very simple. You have to be born again. That's actually where it begins at. And until you are saved, you are not safe from sin. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Praise you, Lord Jesus, today. And go down to verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So victory over sin begins with the new birth experience. You must be born again. You must belong to God. Now, number two, to disarm sin, is that you must be willing to sit down and think. Wow. And I know that anybody watching me, no matter how deep you might be in sin or whatever the snarement might be, maybe there's a little, as we would call sometimes these little pet sins, but they seem to be uh, ongoing pets <laughs> that never go away. Well, you can also sit down and think, and I want to show you how to, how to do this by going to the book of Haggai. Praise God. Haggai chapter 1, verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What does that mean? Consider. It means sit down and think about what's going on in your life. And talk the sin issue over with God. And be willing also to talk it over with yourself. In other words, ask yourself, is it worth this thing that I'm doing? Is it worth the consequences of what it's causing in my life? Look at verse 5 again. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. Is that something that you enjoy? Is that fun? No, of course not. You eat but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Well, the moment you fix one thing, something else is broken. It's like money is going out of your pocket, almost like you've got holes in your pocket. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God is saying, do you really like this outcome? You're being disobedient. You're walking in sin. Things aren't working out for you the way that you want them to. And it's all because of the root of sin that is producing these unfavorable consequences, this unsavory fruit in your life. Do you want to stay stuck in this for the rest of your life? Is this something that brings dignity honor and joy to your life? No, of course not. My friends, sin will always, listen to me today, sin will always erode your dignity. Mm -mm. Praise God. You need to get it out of your life and become very serious about dealing with it. Praise the Lord. Consider your ways. Consider, sit down and talk it over with the Lord. Of course, the Lord wants it out of your life, but you have to want it out of your life. Anything that you tolerate in your life will never, ever leave your life. So consider it. Consider what it's doing and how it's undermining the fulfillment of God's best for your life. Praise the Lord. I mean, even the prodigal son could do this as we see example with him in Luke chapter 15. 
Luke chapter 15. Praise God. Verse, let's go to verse 15. Well, verse 14. But when he had spent all, there rose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, I like how the King James Version says, when he came to his senses. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And he's basically saying, I'm going to repent and see if I can be restored. But he's, it says, when he came to himself, you have to be willing to sit down and think. And what is wisdom? Well, will it, wisdom is the ability to discern difference. But wisdom is also the ability to anticipate a consequence. Sit down and think, what are the consequences of me continuing with this? Some of you are playing with something that is so dangerous that if you don't stop immediately, it can end up destroying the entire destiny that God has planned for you. Praise God. So sit down and reason. Sit down and think. The prodigal son did, and that is the moment where his turnaround began. You have to say, yeah, this is not worth it, because it's not. You have to be willing to say, you know, the devil's been lying to me, because he has. You have to be willing to say, I have been living a lie, because that, if somebody is tolerating the sin and just living with it uh, in an appeasement type way, yes, that is a deception. Praise the Lord. So be willing to sit down and think and deal with this. Praise God. And when you do, God, and when you're ready to repent and go forward, God will wash all of your sins and w away. Even the Lord said in the book of Jeremiah, come now, let us reason together. Let's talk this over. You have God's good plan, and you have the devil's plan, which is uh, sensory-based, is designed to temporarily make you feel good just as quick, quickly and fastly as possible. But God's plan is built so that you have a solid, solid, wonderful, beautiful life. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. God's working right now. Number three, in order to disarm sin and get off the frequency of the devil's remote control, number three is that you're going to have to work with God's system of light. This is fascinating. I want us to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Glory, glory to God. Somebody's coming out right now. Praise the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's go to verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed... That's the Antichrist, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, the breath of his mouth, some translations say the spirit of his mouth, and that brightness, that is referring to revelation, revelation knowledge, to illumination, to light to understanding what God wants you to know. And when you begin to engage in these revelations, that's when you begin to get triumph and victory over the mystery of lawlessness. Look at verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness, and remember, it's a mystery. You know, we have a lot of preachers today that say that we don't need to read the New Testament anymore. Of course, that's a direct contradiction to what the Apostle Paul said, but they've become woke. They've become liberal. And they're saying we don't need the New Test excuse me, the Old Testament anymore. And when you don't know the Old Testament scriptures, 
then you have no understanding of God's law or God's ways. And the mystery of what? Of lawlessness is a mystery of those that do not obey God's law. And when you don't have stop signs and you don't have traffic lights and you don't have a standard of right or wrong or a absolute point of north or south or left or right or truth or lie, then what happens is society cannot exist. You get into lawlessness. It will end in anarchy where there's no control, and that's not good. But it's lawlessness against God's structure, against his kingdom ways, which produce order. And everybody likes order. What is the first sensation or the feeling that you get when you have order? Peace. Try it sometime in your room. The moment you begin to clean your room and put your room in order, you feel peace. Second, the second sensation is happiness. Mm -hmm. Glory, glory to God. But we would have those that would throw out what we would call law in order. We would have those even preachers that are ignorant enough to say you don't need to read the Old Testament. Well, if you don't read the Old Testament, how do you even know what the Ten Commandments are? <laughs> See, you have no absolute for right or wrong. If the Bible says you shall not steal, but you don't know that because you've never read that, you, you don't even know what the law is. You have no absolutes because I've met people. I've met Christians that, that have told me, well, now, Pastor Stephen, sometimes it's okay to steal. And I'm thinking, well, I would never want you to work for me because you're saying that there are justifiable reasons to steal when there's not. There, there never is. You shall not steal. That's it. That settles it. Well, Pastor Stephen, surely God understands. Yeah, he understands that you're a thief <laughs> if you're stealing. But there's the mystery of lawlessness. And Paul said it's, it's already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. You know, we had, uh, like a year or so ago, we had all the rioting. We had elements of lawlessness, of people root, uh, looting and robbing stores. And that's absolute lawlessness. But you have to remember, these forms of lawlessness that look like, you know, things are completely going haywire. Uh, it's still lawlessness on a small degree. You just wait till the restraining force is taken out of the way. Then it's every man for himself. Mm -mm. Then it is elements of all out hell on earth. Why? There's no law anymore. <laughs> it's whoever is ruling, which will be the Antichrist in his beast system. It's done by terror and force and power. And uh, all kinds of evil will be um, released upon the earth. So, yes, we saw lawlessness over the last two years, and uh, we saw it brushed off as being, you know, peaceful, whatever. No, no, it was, it was lawlessness. But that's nothing compared to what's, becoming, uh, what's coming. But see, it's a mystery. What is going on? What's causing all of this? Why are people so angry? Why are people upset? And there's no justifiable reason except that there's, there's lawlessness, there's iniquity at work. There are controlling powers behind the scenes. Mm -mm. Pastor Stephen, did you go break into one of those stores and get you some, uh, uh, some free Dr. Pepper? No, because the remote control uh, wasn't working on me. Mm -mm. And I'm sure it didn't work on many of you that are watching, praise God. Nor would you ever justify such wickedness as that. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. But the mystery of it, that's, that is the downward spiral of what it is. And my friends, the light is the key to overcoming the darkness. It's the light. And that's how it's going to be wrapped up. The lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy how with the brightness of his coming. So light is the victory over darkness. And when I'm talking about light, I'm talking about revelations and understanding the ways of God that take you into freedom. 
as you begin to work with the Holy Spirit. Remember, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, Pastor Stephen, I don't have liberty in this area. Well, there's something then about the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you yet don't understand. Praise God. Hosea chapter 4. Let's turn over there. Let's turn way back to the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people. So these are God's people. I've had Christians come to me in, uh, for example, like private counseling sessions, uh, confessing things that they're stuck in. And they, know, they don't know how to get out. And honestly, they don't. They don't. They sometimes want to get out, but they can't. Why? There's a controlling power that's now got them locked down, and they've gotten themselves into something. And sin is like a spider web. You just get all tangled up in it, and you're all tripped up. And next thing you know, you're like, wow, uh, how do I get out? Because now I'm tangled up. And I've had quite a few people ask me, Pastor Stephen, how do I stop? And I take them to verse 6. My people are destroyed. Why? For lack of prayer? No, although prayer is very important. Uh, for lack of a 40-day fast? No, although fasting is very important. But it says here, for lack of knowledge. So there is destruction that can be associated with, with what you don't know. Now, let me tell you this today. And this is very, very important. The devil... He loves hiding behind your ignorance and then afflicting you. Now, I'm not saying that anybody watching is ignorant. That's not what I'm saying. But when I'm talking about ignorance, I'm talking about what you don't know. That is where the devil hides. He hides in the area of what you don't know. And from that veiled position of your ignorance or what you don't know, that's where he's afflicting you from. So what, how do you fix that light? That's how, you fi that's how you fix it. You turn the light on and you realize how he's working, how he's operating, and how you can operate against it from a position of light versus darkness. And that light will always lead you every single time into a triumphant experience. Because we can have a battle anytime. We can go into a dark place anytime. And I can turn on, you know, I can come into this, this studio with all the lights off, but, and it's dark. But the moment I flip that switch, uh, it, it, the, the darkness by force has to yield. It has to give it up. And now the room is filled with light. And that can be your experience also. Praise God. Everywhere in the Word of God is answers all over the place. The, the Bible is God's answer book for you so that if there's anything holding you down or entangling you, you can find the solution in the Word of God. It is sourced in light. Praise God. And you take that light and it gives you victory. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to uh, the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. And let's go to verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not understand it. Why? They wanted to stay in their darkness. But if you want to come out, the light, my friends, is the way. Psalm 119, this is very, very clear and very, very true. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light, but it's the illuminated word. It's the word that the Holy Spirit has quickened to your understanding. And you think, that's it. Devil, you can't pull that on me anymore. It's like a coach that has a team and they're losing, and they're losing, but they figure out how to fix their losses, and suddenly they can't be pushed around anymore, and then they go from the loss column into the win column, but it comes through the right understanding. That's why in the sports realm, 
They are willing to pay a good coach millions and millions of dollars. Even on a collegiate level, they'll pay that coach millions of dollars. On a pro level, they'll pay that person a whole lot more. Why? There's a difference in what that one knows as compared to what that one knows. This one's a winner. Therefore, there's certain knowledge that he's walking in that those with the losing records do not have. And he is making application of that knowledge, and it's working for him in the win-loss columns of his past performances. Praise God. Praise the Lord. The entrance of your words gives light. That's what you need. Praise the Lord. It's that light that will dispel that dark area out of your life, and it will never, ever entangle you ever again. Praise God. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's turn over there. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Now, we have looked, just for a brief moment, at the mystery of lawlessness. And it's a never-ending downward spiral of a pit of filth. It's nothing that you want to stare into, okay? But here is a mystery that you can look into and that God wants you to study and get a good understanding of as much as you can, because there will always be an element to this of mystery, because it's spiritual. Verse 16, and without controversy, in other words, there's no question about it, great is the mystery of godliness. See, it's just a matter of what you want to look into. Lawlessness, well, we know what that is. That's just garbage. That's all it is. It's just deeper and deeper levels of it. And there is... Uh, you know, there's personal lawlessness, and then it can grow to you have a, a lawless, maybe board of directors or a, a governing committee, and then you could have states or even nation states that are given over to corruption, where the more you look into it, the more lawlessness you see. You see bribes and lying and theft and murder and cover ups. What is that? That's all the realm of lawlessness. And so uh, uh, it'll never end because there's so much of it in the earth, but that is a frequency that we stay off of and we look into verse 16. Mm -mm. Now, here's the thing. If you're not into the mystery of godliness, you can look at lawlessness and it can look powerful to you. You, 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 could, you could think, how do even people uh, not give into it? It's so strong. It's like a, uh, it's like a magnetic pull. It's like a global remote control that's influencing so many people. Oh, but my friends, the, the mystery of godliness has so much light and illumination that this is actually what's happening. They're standing over there in the darkness, and they're looking at us that are operating in the mystery of godliness, and they're thinking, wow, what a beautiful life. Wow, what a, what, what a life. I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Praise the Lord. And that is our stance. That is our position. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That one alone, you could camp on that statement for the rest of your life and never plumb the depths of that statement. God became a human. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's incredible. And he was walking around on the earth for 30 plus years. <laughs> God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So Jesus was manifested, justified, seen, preached, believed, received. That is the mystery of godliness. And you can just enjoy that and swim in that all that you want. Why? It's light, and it makes you stronger. And you realize also, oh, this is the kingdom secret. I can get over here and get on this frequency, and I can be strong and then begin to implement other keys. I'll be talking about some of those in the days to come. And you realize, wow, this is a very, very same safe place, and you are in a, you are in a canopy of protection. Praise the Lord. It's a place of light. Mm -mm, the mystery of godliness. So God is going to provide such brightness of light 
that you will easily, hear me today, you'll easily disarm the forces of darkness that have been working against you, and you'll never be subject to their remote control ever again. All the devil's going to be doing against you is just pushing it over and over and over and over, over and over, every single button. And they just say, it's not working. It's not working. Praise God, you're free. You're free. It's disconnected from you. Now, those out in the world, yep, you hear about it all the time. The devil's pushing the buttons, and you'll see more corruption, more corruption in politics, more corruption in government, uh, sometimes even in areas of corruption, even within the church. That's because you have those that would be in these various capacities that are yielding to those invisible controlling powers. But as far as you no, praise God, walking pure and clean. And when Jesus comes back, the bride will be pure and spotless without, gar uh, without spot or wrinkle on the garment. Those are the ones that are not subjected to the remote control. Praise God. They have gotten enough light to understand that they can live triumphantly, even in a world where the mystery of lawlessness would swirl, and even the Antichrist just striving so bad, wants to come on the scene so bad, but it just has not yet been his time. You've got all kinds of men lined up that would do anything to be the one to be selected, to be the evil world leader. And they would just do anything to be that person. So you have a lot of people that have lots of money, some maybe even billions of dollars. So for them, it's not a money issue anymore. They've already got plenty of that. What do some of these people want? They want power. They want to be able to control people. They want to be able to control nations. Some already do. So that they want to be able to control the world. They have their own ideas, their own ideologies and plans. And eventually one, uh, one will be selected for that purpose, selected by the devil. And, but this can't happen until there's the timing for that. But praise God, we're going to be walking with the Lord shining as stars in the midst of gross darkness. And God's going to position you in such light and beauty and glory, praise God, and purity, that you're going to shine. And watch this. You're going to smell pure in the spirit realm. Sin stinks, and sin sinks your destiny. Eradicate it from your life. Praise God. Let me say it again. Sin stinks, and sin sinks your destiny. Don't play games with it. Praise the Lord. Glory, glory. In the natural realm, if you have a, a shark, let's take the great white shark. Uh, and, you know, they can get real long, real big, 16 feet, 12 feet, you know, big size, you know, up to a couple thousand pounds. But it is amazing to see how big God designed their noses to be. Their nose can be like that long, that, you know, the tip of their nose. And they're really the garbage trucks of the ocean. They're scavengers. And they have very big noses. But within that nose, it's kind of like an airplane. At the, of, on the nose of an airplane, if you open the nose of the airplane up, that's where all the, uh, like, you know, all of your high advanced electronics are. You know, you've got your all kinds of things in there from radar to everything else, okay? It's all packed in the nose of the plane. Same thing with the shark. He's got all this sensory equipment in his nose, and a shark can smell one drop of blood from two miles away in the water. You could be out in the ocean, out in the middle of nowhere, and you put one little drop of blood in the water, and that begins, these little tiny molecules go out. But he's got, he's got an ability, these perceptors that pick up on that blood. And what do they do? Well, they do what God designed them to do, to clean up the oceans, and they, they're headed that direction. They're headed that direction. So how you smell in the spirit realm is very important because uh, of what you attract. Because in the spirit realm, angels, demons, the devil, God, uh, in the spirit realm is all wide open. It's all open. They, they can see and they can also smell. Praise the Lord. Glory, glory to God. In the meetings in which I, I minister, when my wife and I start ministering to people and laying hands on people, very often fragrances of, uh, you know, all types of, almost anything you can think of, fragrances begin to come forth. And prophetically, we are able to interpret those fragrances and what they mean. 
But you have to understand also that while that is a manifestation of the Spirit, there's a personal manifestation of your individual walk that also has a fragrance. Padre Pio, the Catholic priest, he had a fragrance that emitted from him. Uh, the, most people that smelled it said it smelled like violets, a very sweet fragrance. But they said at the same time it smelled like violets. It wasn't violets. It was something supernatural. Uh, what's going on? You have a holy man living a holy life in the spirit realm that emits something. Something's coming off of you. Really, when it comes to holy living, that's why many look towards some of the great saints. Why? Because they did great miracles? Well, yes, but, you know, throughout the church world, you'll find many that operate in signs, wonders, and miracles. But when you, when you want to look at men and also women that got the victory over sin and they're living clean, in other words, the devil doesn't have dirty laundry on them or something like that, but they're living clean, then that's often where you start looking at for inspiration. Why? Because they're living clean and it's, and it's being verified by the Holy Spirit because they're emitting uh, these fragrances that were heavenly that came off of them. In my book, uh, my book about supernatural fragrances, there was one lady, uh, she was a shepherdess, she was a young girl, and she had the most phenomenal fragrance, they said, that came off of her that when people would get around her, they could smell this incredibly heavenly fragrance. But that's because of the very devoted life that she had with God. Oftentimes, when you look in, at people that had lives like that, they were very centered in the sense where they're not out doing a million things. Not that they aren't busy. They're very much, but they're very much on assignment and doing that only thing and, and staying in that and uh, the good ones stayed in it for their entire lives. And th that fragrance would also stay there as well. Praise God. That is the victory of Christ being expressed in you. Pastor Stephen, how do I know when I'm winning? How will I know when the tide starts to turn and I start breaking loose from all this junk that would try to pull on me and hold me down? Here's, here's a great indicator. You ready for this? <laughs> when you wake up in the morning... Is there a song? Because when you're close with God and you're really walking with Him, you're dialed in and things are going good with you and God, every single morning you wake up, there'll be a song. No, I'm not talking about a country western song where you can go out and start boot scooting all over the place. No, that's not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about a pop song or a romantic love song, you know, top 40, you know, pop music. No, no, I'm talking about a godly song that honors Jesus Christ. When you're walking with the Lord, you'll get songs in the morning. You'll even get songs sometimes in the middle of the night. And God is also enrobing you with this fragrance. Praise God. Praise God. Glory. Those are just indicators that you're making tremendous headway. And then what you do is you just, it's like a car. When you want to go faster, you just push the gas pedal down more. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Somebody's getting free right now. Somebody's also smelling in the spirit realm right now, and you're smelling something good. Uh, somebody's smelling a, a pie, a, like a baked pie in the oven. Depending on what that pie is, uh, has a prophetic meaning. Somebody, you're smelling apple, a uh, baked apple pie. That actually represents liberty and freedom. Praise the Lord. Now, I, I don't have time to explain why that means that, but that's what that means. And I, I do give scriptures in my book, but I'm just moving quickly right now. Somebody, you're smelling blueberry pie uh, cooking. That's a healing anointing. Praise God. And also, that's also an anointing to see in the prophetic realm. Blueberries are blue. That's uh, color blue is prophetic. And uh, blueberries actually look like little eyeballs. Praise God. So God's giving somebody a greater sense of seeing in the spirit realm. So this is opening up right now. Praise God. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Mm. Somebody is either seeing or smelling taffy, the candy, right now. Praise God. Mm. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. God's going to bring you into something that's going to stretch you. <laughs> that's how they make the taffy. But it's a good thing. You're being made into something beautiful. A beautiful stretching is going to take place. God's in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. 
We thank you for freedom. Father, there's a lot of filth in the world. But I thank you, Father, that there's a neutralizing force, the force of your Holy Spirit. And as we're walking with him, so much of the things that are out there, we're not even going to be, we're not even going to even know about it because it doesn't touch us, affect us in any way. We thank you, Father, that we're walking in the light and the world envies your glorious church. Now, Father, we give you praise. We give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll do some more teaching on this subject in the coming days. It's a fascinating subject. Praise God. And you can say goodbye to the enemy's past power to control you. Hallelujah. If you're watching today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, the escape from sin begins with the salvation experience. If that's you, pray this prayer right now. Christ will save you right now and give you his new life. Just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Wash my sins away. I give my life completely to you. Jesus, write my name in your book of life and step into my life and lead me and guide me from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Welcome to the family of God. Now, let's all together take communion today because communion is the receiving of the miracle meal. Communion what it does, it brings you into union with Jesus, union with God. And what is not permitted to be in Jesus is not permitted to be in you. That's what is being enforced when we take communion. So I want to encourage you right now, grab some grape juice, which is what I have in my cup. Grab some bread, a little unleavened bread, whatever you have. Okay, grab it. Let's pray over it together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread, the juice. We consecrate it right now. We set it apart as being holy. And we thank you that this is now the flesh and the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you that as we, we receive the Lord's flesh, his body, that we receive strength and empowerment over temptation and over sin. We give you praise, O oh God. We thank you for your word being so bright that it shows us the way out. We thank you there's always a way out. We rejoice in you and we take it. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive. Praise God. Praise God. There's, a, there's like three ladies, two or three. See, there are two or three ladies. You've been ca so caught up in the things of the world that if you would have lived back in the day of Lot, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, you probably would have gotten turned into a pillar of salt, just like Lot's wife did. Why? She turned and looked back. Why? She loved the world. She loved the world system. Sodom and Gomorrah were very perverted during that time, but they also were extremely uh, wealthy. It was, a, it was the most, most luxurious, opulent place to live because they were taking those big chunks of bitumen or what we would know today, modern day oil. These are big oil chunks that would float up there at the other, at the Dead Sea and also would come up in these areas. They would take it and they would sell it down in Egypt and the place was just uh, loaded with wealth. But we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife turned to look back because she loved the city so much. She got turned into a pillar of salt. Not a good ending, but my friends... As you take communion, that stuff breaks off of you. Hallelujah. There's three ladies you're getting delivered from shopping addictions, from uh, uh, buying things on, on the internet, uh, wasting money, buying shopping on, uh, on TV and ordering all kinds of trinkets and gadgets and doodads. It's junk. It's junk. It's, it's just a shopping spirit. It's the spirit of the world. You're being delivered and set free right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, its mighty cleansing power. And we thank you, Father, that what was not allowed to be in Jesus can't be in us. We thank you, Father, that Jesus didn't have a secret smoking addiction. 
We thank you that he wasn't smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and still going out and preaching and holding meetings and praying for the sick. We thank you that he was pure, that he was clean. We thank you, O God. Hallelujah. Mm -mm. Father, we thank you that Jesus didn't slip up and let a nasty, profane word, a cuss word fly out and go, oops, didn't mean to say that. Father, we thank you that it wasn't in him. We thank you that he was walking in triumph over sin and temptation. And we thank you for the same experience being enforced as we take communion. And we thank you for union with you, O oh God, through your son. We thank you for purity. Oh, hallelujah. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. We receive the blood of Jesus now. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's receive. The world may laugh. Oh, they will. I've had many family members laugh at me and Kelly because we don't drink alcohol. Well, they go crazy over it. They go crazy over it. And we don't drink it. And I don't drink it simply because I'm a minister. Simply because I'm on TV and somebody might see me and that might be a bad example. I understand all that. I drink it because of my own personal, excuse me, I don't drink it because of my own personal sanctification. I don't care if every Christian on the earth drinks it. I'm not drinking that demon drink. I'm not putting alcohol into my body. I don't want to be under any influence except the influence of the Holy Spirit and the mighty living word of God. Hallelujah. I don't want to be under the influence of drugs, alcohol, narcotics, nothing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, I've had many people laugh at me because uh, during a family wedding or a family gathering or something like that, I wouldn't get in on the joke or I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, do all the drinking stuff that they do. Uh, I have no interest in that stupid, stupid stuff. I have no desire to go to a carnal party where people are walking around with cocktails, acting all high-minded and snooty and haughty. No, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> and you have a lot of church people that love that. Eat it up. Eat it up. Well, if that's what you want, eat it up because it's already passing away. It's already passing off the scene. Woo, things are wrapping up. The end of the age is wrapping up. You have to choose who you're going to serve because the Antichrist is wanting to come on the scene so bad. Hallelujah. So you either all in with God or you'll get swept and sucked into that very powerful undercurrent of the world system. And if you compromise now, trust me, there'll be all kinds of compromising coming on when the old Antichrist shows up and says you can't buy or sell unless you take the mark. And if you've justified sin up to that point, oh, I know you say you'll never do it, but people will suddenly begin justifying, well, surely God understands I have to take the mark. I've got to be able to buy. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Choose now who you're going to serve and cut sin, the practice of any form of sin, out of your life. Praise God. Father, bless your people. We thank you that we have received communion. We have received strength. We thank you, Father, for the blood weapon. We thank you for freedom from any form of addiction. We give you praise. And we thank you for a sustained walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thanks for watching today. I'll see you back next time. Have a great week. Bye-bye.